Welcome. We're having people join coming in out of the waiting room. Thank you so much for joining us today. As we're waiting people for people to come in, feel free to go ahead and use the chat function at the bottom and tell us uh, when you graduate from UIC, if you are a graduate, and where you're calling in from today, whether that's uh, Chicago, and if so, which neighborhood in Chicago or the suburbs or anywhere in the world. We're happy that you are all joining us and uh, we'll get started here in just a few seconds. But go ahead and use that chat feature because we're gonna ask you to use it throughout. So we'd love to hear where you're calling in from, zooming in from perhaps is the correct terminology. Oh, somebody from Atlanta, Georgia, love it. Another come in Los Angeles. You know, even though that we are in such an interesting time, it's great to see people, oh, Japan, I think that's going to win for distance, but we'll see. Um, okay, this is great. Keep typing in. I'm going to go ahead and get our program started. We will have people continue to join, which we will welcome. Um, so good afternoon and thank you for joining us. My name is Karen Corman and I have the privilege of being the executive director of your UIC Alumni Association. Welcome to our UIC Alumni Exchange Series. We are hosting weekly events that bring you news, knowledge, and entertainment to help you explore, connect, and even escape from the everyday with a community of UIC alumni and faculty experts. You're gonna hear me say this a few times today, but I encourage you to visit go.uic.edu backslash alumni exchange for the latest and greatest programming. We are thrilled to be joined by two-time alumnus, Jason Marcus Walk, who is the former historian at UIC, to share his knowledge with us today. I'm gonna to turn it over to Jason. Thanks again, Jason, for being here and take it away. Absolutely, it's my good pleasure. Uh, in the next 45 minutes or so, uh, looking forward to taking you through uh, really the fascinating history uh, of our campus. Um, the fun th one of the fun things about UIC history is that uh, you can't really um, isolated from its surroundings. And so you get uh, everything from quite a bit, you know, architectural history, Chicago history, you know, politics, uh, higher ed policy, race relations. It's, it's uh, kind of all encompassing. So we'll be coming back and forth uh, to this map uh, on your screen. Um, probably one of the first questions that uh, university begs is when does it begin? And depending on when you're, where you interface with the campus, uh, that might answer the question. So you see the earliest academic unit of the university is College of Pharmacy, so predates the Civil War, 1859. Uh, perhaps the founding of the university at Urbana in 1867. If you're in some of the health sciences, uh, medicine, uh, the founding of uh, College of Physicians and Surgeons, which later affiliates and is incorporated as our College of Medicine, the 1880s. Uh, same thing with dentistry, um, pharmacy, uh, you know, maybe, you know, uh, early 20th century. Undergrads might say 1946 with the, uh, the, the two-year operation at Navy Pier, or 1965 when you get a four-year degree at uh, University of Illinois Chicago Circle, or 1982, uh, I guess our, most, <laughs> our more recent birth date you could choose from, uh, the merger of the University of Illinois at the Medical Center with the uh, Circle Campus. And so we'll be coming back and forth to this map as I had mentioned. Um, starting off uh, the Health Sciences uh, Center for UIC's West Campus. Now the origins of the university lie in the Morrell, uh, the Morrell Act of 1862. Morrell was a congressman from, uh, from Connecticut, and not just him, but also Jonathan Baldwin Turner in Illinois, and they were pressuring the federal government to ante up land to the states. The states would then uh, take that money, sell it off, and with that, that would, uh, the proceeds, that would be what would be used for uh, raising up the state university. So hence the land grant when you, some of you may have heard that term uh, attached to certain universities. Uh, not all universities are land grants, but uh, whichever ones were raised up with the proceeds of that, uh, that land sale. So there you have uh, Turner, the Illinoisan, and then this view is, uh, if anybody's ever stood in the Illini Union at uh, Urbana, looked across Green Street out to Boneyard Creek, this is the view. It's one of my former colleagues in the historian's office who did do his undergrad at Urbana. He used to like to joke that hasn't changed a lot. Now the earliest, uh, earliest unit, as I said, academic unit is the College of Pharmacy. And so here you had, uh, you know, at this time, Chicago College of Pharmacy, it's a private institution, downtown loop location. Now due to the fire, it is inactive for a, a number of years, but uh, it is the oldest academic unit. Uh, and then the College of Physicians and Surgeons, which becomes our College of Medicine. What this is, and you had not just 
PNS, but uh, you know, really just boatloads of them throughout the country. You had these proprietary med schools in the uh, 1880s, 1890s. A bunch of docs, you know, get together, pool their resources, and uh, raise up a college, you know, college of medicine. Um, and so it's uh, originally affiliated, uh, and then later and in fully incorporated as our college of medicine. Now, college of medicine is the uh, when I literally I look at this picture, I, uh, I just think about when I had my appendix out, and I'm just like, thank God for uh, advancements. Because here you have a surgical uh, lecture going on. I don't know how one uh, learns to, you know, sew, cut open, and, and sew back together the, uh, the innards of a body, but this is a, this is a surgical lecture. Uh, PNS, our um, College of Medicine, was the first uh, west of the Appalachians to have uh, laboratory experience. J.B. Murphy, a, a prominent PNS uh, professor and a local Chicago surgeon, uh, when Teddy Roosevelt shot in Milwaukee, he was giving a speech, he brings him south to Chicago and it's Murphy that sews them back together. Um, but here you have, uh, you know, women, which is uh, also rather groundbreaking. It's part of our College of Physicians and Surgeons. Our College of Dentistry was the first uh, west of the Appalachians to have electric drills. I don't do too well with the dentist, so I can only imagine being at the mercy of someone on a foot pump doing dental work. So, College athletics, always been a big part of campus life. So here you have our College of Medicine basketball team, 1903. Uh, now let's say that, time to get a little interactive. If you were choosing a color scheme for a College of Medicine, what two colors would you choose you know, to go with. So one, no one ever gets this. So I'll just, here's the gimme, chocolate brown. But then what might the other colors be? Give me the one other color. Um, we'll see if we can pull up a minute. There we go. So your options are blue, red, yellow, or green. What would you match with chocolate brown? All right, well, just give it a couple more seconds and I think we have a winner between yellow and red. Well, all right, very closer than I thought. Okay, yep, red's your winner. And uh, yes, in fact, it was red. So what these colors represented, here, give you an idea. Um, so you have chocolate brown, which represented iodine. So think like 1982 San Diego Padre road jerseys. I mean, yeah, pretty brown. And then red represented blood. So iodine and blood, those were your, those were your college colors for your college of medicine. So not particularly attractive. Now, uh, UIC campus is uh, chock full of uh, baseball history. We'll get to that in a moment. The original location for PNS was, if you're familiar where the helipad is for uh, Cook County, uh, basically Harrison and Ogden, that was the original location. Now, the current imprint of our College of Medicine, which is Polk, Taylor, uh, Wolcott, and Wood Street, uh, Wolcott used to be Lincoln, that, uh, that was the old West Side ball field. That was the place where the Chicago Cubs were the first Major League Baseball team to win back-to-back -back World Series in 1907 and 08. Some interesting lingo comes out of the old West Side ball field. So, uh, well, home plate basically is where the Dean's office ends up. If you were a left-handed pitcher at the old West Side ball field, you were oriented to the south. So that's where the term southpaw comes from, you know, for a pitcher, quarterback, just anybody that throws left-handed. So that's the West Side ball field. And then just outside of left field, you got to understand uh, there's no wall. Basically, just fans show up with lawn chairs uh, and, and just sort of form a perimeter, I guess. And so just outside of left field, though, was the Illinois Neuropsychiatric Institute. And so the, the, the term for sort of a crazy thought, like, oh, where'd that come from? Oh, way out left field. That comes from the UIC campus and the old West Side ball field. Uh, so something for Cub fans, and then we also have something for Sox fans. Uh, the 1919 World Series in which the, uh, the White Sox through the World Series became known as the Black Sox, shoeless Joe Jackson. The payoffs for that all went down at a little Italian cafe, basically at Polk and Halstead. So if you know where the loading dock is for Student Center East um, or Chicago Circle Center, whichever you're familiar with, uh, yeah, that, uh, so something for Cubs and, and Sox fans on our campus. Now, a lot of the, uh, the West Side, um, it's, it's, interesting, it's interesting to juxtapose West Side campus architecture with East Side, because it's vastly different. Uh, West Side is more piecemeal and, and definitely more of a traditional college, uh, 
I guess, motif. A lot of the buildings get built or rebuilt with New Deal money. And so, you know, you've got the uh, College of uh, well, now Medicine and Dentistry at the time, Pharmacy, before the other buildings get built. And uh, if you take a cruise on the west side now, it's interesting because you've got more modern construction. And so you kind of have this juxtaposition, uh, especially over by, um, I would say, Wolcott and Taylor. It's probably the best example uh, right there along Wolcott. In 1941, Illinois sets up uh, yet another regulatory uh, institution, in this case, the Illinois Medical, uh, Medical District. Doesn't have the power of taxation, but it does have eminent domain. To kind of orient you, the uh, angled street on the left, that's Ogden Avenue. Top side would be uh, the Congress, uh, Congress Expressway, later Eisenhower Expressway. And then uh, off screen is uh, Roosevelt Road, I guess the last uh, east-west artery there you have is uh, Taylor Street. So it's a major, uh, one of the major, one of the, the largest concentrations of healthcare in the world, the clearinghouse for medical education and research, uh, currently comprised of a UIC Hospital, uh, Rush, Cook um, County, and then Jesse Brown VA. I'm also a Naval uh, historian, see so a little bonus coverage. If anybody ever wondered who Jesse Brown was, Jesse Brown was the first carrier qualified African American naval aviator. He was shot down over Korea uh, in his Corsair. But so we pay homage to Jesse Brown. All right, coming back to uh, the map. So we dealt with UIC's West Campus, the Health Sciences Center. Now we're going to move off map. Illinois' largest tourist attraction. I trust we've all been to Navy Pier. In 1944, the uh, uh, Illinois, or the, in 1944, Congress passes the Servicemen's Readjustment Act. We know it is the GI Bill. Basically, it calls for things like uh, home loans and, and trade school uh, for, for returning GIs, because you have this influx of GIs that have been off the war. How are you going to integrate them back into society? So this is what the GI Bill does. But by far, its most sweeping change is that it opens up higher education to the masses. Uh, the University of Illinois pledges to service all qualified returning GIs. You couldn't fit them all at Urbana would have doubled the size of the campus. So what the university does is it sets up two branch campuses, one in Galesburg, which had, uh, was the site of the old uh, Mayo Clinic, uh, doing a lot of work with, uh, with returning GIs. That's why we have uh, such a great OTPT, uh, you know, roots education, really is the work done with returning GIs that were wounded during the war. Uh, same thing with Navy Pier. Uh, the idea would be that these institutions would serve for three years, pretty much, you know, just this influx of, of GIs, and then they would be stood down. That's the case with Galesburg. The case is, uh, that's not the case in Chicago with Navy Pier. Um, to give you an idea, the university is renting out the north end, east and west end of the pier. It's still a working pier to the south. Uh, I always tell students if you're having trouble taking notes and focusing, well, maybe not so much. Uh, these students were dealing with a working pier. You had ships, horns going off, stevedores unloading ships. Um, one of my favorite lines doing some world history was, uh, had some uh, couple of former students uh, recalling when a seaplane crashed outside the library window. So definitely not your typical university experience. And uh, I've seen the correspondence, the Dean of Women is driven nuts with the thought that, you know, co-eds, you know, females on campus would be mingling with lake sailors. And then you open up the St. Lawrence Seaway and then you got international sailors and I don't know what to do. But um, this was not junior college. Okay, so Galesburg as well as Navy Pier. What this was was the first two years at Urbana. It was Urbana grade coursework. You do the first two years at Galesburg or Navy Pier and then transfer. Uh, the numbers for Chicago, probably about half end up at the pier. Uh, more, more than likely, if you're at the pier, you're going to end up at one of the, uh, the privates in town, Northwestern, uh, DePaul, Loyola, IIT, because in many cases, our students, uh, you know, they couldn't afford to just uproot and go down to Urbana, you know, having jobs as well as family. Uh, and these were very squared away students. Uh, my father was a Vietnam era UIC student, and he used to talk about how the professors would just, you know, he's back from naval service, but uh, would just rip into these students and, and always comparing them to these era, uh, you know, veterans. But the fact is they lost, you know, three, four, five years of their life fighting in the Second World War. So they were very committed to getting through. They were going to, you know, jack around, waste a bunch of time. Um, so definitely very scored away students. Now what made the pier a viable location for uh, higher education was the fact that it was the site of several naval training schools during the Second World War. 
So the Navy moves in on uh, 1 August 1941 and uh, start erecting you know, barricades as well as uh, you know, things like chow hall, library, chapel, etc. They drop about 3 million in to get the place squared away. They're training radar men, sonar men, uh, aviation and motor machinist mates. They knew that the war wasn't gonna last forever, so it's kind of stopgap. And so by the time the university comes aboard, one October of 46, uh, the place is kind of falling apart. Now, this is, uh, and trust we've all been in the grand ballroom at Navy Pier. This, uh, this is placement testing going on. This is also the site of women's PE. And you can see the basketball hoop up there. And then if you look in the lower right-hand corner, I think he's cheating. It's, maybe it's just me. I always kind of hope that one. Um, and then this is, this is pretty much the uh, mecca of social life at the pier. It's kind of like high school meets Urbana because because of the small confines, it's kind of like high school. Uh, tops out at about 5,000 students, and there's a waiting list. I mean, the demand for higher education in Chicago is huge. So that's why where Galesburg closes, the pier you know, remains from 46 to 65. Uh, but so you have things like a farmer's ball in the city at Navy Pier. And like I said, because of the small confines, it's kind of like high school where everyone just kind of knows each other. And they have these mixers called Coke dances. Uh, but yeah, so this is the uh, site of women's pee and kind of where you did your socialization. Now, it being a former naval training school, you had all this uh, war surplus laying around, which was made useful, as you can see, engineering students using that. But uh, talking about, you know, by the time the, uh, the war is over, the place is really falling apart. So here you have an engineering classroom space. Uh, you got missing bulkheads. A wise professor would often lecture from a pallet because, uh, you know, as the lake winds would pick up and it might begin to rain, classrooms would often flood out. So that was life at the pier. My colleagues and I always enjoyed this slide because as early as 1951, we were known as UIC. The official name of the institution was the University of Illinois Chicago Undergraduate Division, UIC CUD, or UI CUD. But the reality is it was, you know, was known as UIC. So as early as the uh, you know, first homecoming in 1951, you have the cheerleaders there showing our, uh, our designation. The, uh, the pier lent itself to unique offerings in, in PE because of its location. So you had uh, fishing and swimming, boating in an actual lake. Shore-based uh, activities went on in Grant Park. And talking about these uh, you know, really dedicated students, they come to the pier having you know, fought in the Second World War, definitely looking to get through. Um, as fast as possible and get on with their lives. And so uh, architecture was definitely uh, a bastion of kind of this can-do attitude. And so uh, the professors were so impressed, they invited uh, legendary architect Frank Lloyd Wright out to campus, and here he is doing critique of student work in 1948. All right, time for a trivia question. University of Illinois was originally offered to what city? Of course, it ends up in Urbana, but what city do you think it ended up uh, or was originally offered to? Report, Joliet, Cairo, or Peoria? Interesting. Just a few more moments. All right, there we go. Peoria is our winner. Unfortunately, Peoria is not the winner. So all roads lead to Urbana, or so the literature says. The, uh, the, uh, the university was actually offered to Joliet. Joliet citizens took a pass. Instead, I can't hear you, so, but uh, just imagine, right? What do you think they took? Well, what's in Joliet? Uh, for any of my friends that work in juvenile detention, they would know. Statesville, right? The prison. So apparently the residents of Joliet felt that there was more economic engine in, uh, you know, prisoner, I don't say rehabilitation, I don't know. Uh, than higher education, but uh, so it ends up at Urbana. Now, despite the fact uh, that, you know, the, all roads lead to Urmata, uh, Urbana, as the, uh, I'll call it propaganda would tell you, the real need for public higher education is in Illinois. Illinois is a very diverse state. Southern Illinois is very much the South. Uh, in Chicago, you have lots of options, right, uh, with, you know, just the ethnic diversity ethnic racial diversity you have institutions uh, often with a religious tradition so like think DePaul, Loyola, etc. Northwestern but uh, 
you know, these are expensive, they're private, there's no public option in Chicago. And so that's why the pier is open for as long as it is. Now, almost immediately, students at the pier begin to push for a four year campus. So in this case, one of the student organizations that was very active was known as the Quad Council, Quad representing four. And pretty much their whole goal as a student org was to push for a four year university only campus in the city. Uh, some of the, the tactics they use are things like this mile long petition in 1953, which, uh, Sections of it are, are, you know, they're signed and then sent off to the governor, the mayor of the city of Chicago, president of the board of trustees, and the president of the university. Now, by far the person most responsible for UIC's existence uh, is Mayor Richard J. Daley. As early as 1936, according to the family, although I would argue probably once he's in the Senate, maybe 44, 46, he's pushing for a four-year campus four-year university in Chicago, not actually a four-year University of Illinois campus. So once it's a, so you have a board of trustees that's very resistant to building a Chicago campus. It's kind of like Manifest Destiny. If you let a Chicago campus, you know, be born, it will grow. And uh, kind of the thought becomes, if you let it grow, it will suck off athletic and acad uh, athletic talent and academic resources. You just can't let that happen. Um, once you get the trustees to finally, but what you have is you have the trustees being leveraged through the state house by a very powerful Chicago mayor. They finally agree to build it, but once you, you know, agree to build it, you gotta fund it. So there's uh, two bond issues, one in 1958, and it gets voted down. Uh, then in 1960, there's a bond issues up. Now for you, those of you, you know, political uh, savvy with your political history, you know, that's the Nixon Kennedy presidential election. I would argue Daly was just as, you know, adamant about wanting to see the, the funds secured for the construction of uh, UIC as he was, you know, the Democrats wanting back the White House. Now this, this is, uh, it's, uh, I believe it's, 100, it's $150 million with the bulk of it going to fund uh, UIC, but then also if you do something for up north, you got to do something for down south. So the funds are also secured to build, this is where SIU Edwardsville funding comes in. So it's all the same bond issue. And then the rest of the money is distributed to the directional schools, Northern, Western, Eastern. Uh, and it only passes in three counties, Madison and St. Clair. Now realize there was no public option if you're, you know, even if like if you're in St. Louis. So it'd be cheaper to send your kids into Illinois right across the river, send them to SIU Edwardsville. But so Madison and St. Clair County, it passes in, in those two and then in Cook County. So. And then it, of course, passes statewide. So really, it gives you the power, uh, really, the, the, the massive population of Cook County, uh, as well as, uh, you know, the, the power of the Democrat machine at the time to get the vote out. So once you get the funding secured, where are you going to locate it? And so site selection. Uh, most of the trustees, their experience, they're, they're almost exclusively Urbana grads. Uh, and so their thought is Miller Meadow or Riverside Golf Course. So if you know where Loyola Med Center is, like First Avenue, Roosevelt Road, back then, you know, it's, it's definitely much more suburban, rural almost. So that's kind of where they wanted to go. The faculty polled, they wanted to stay out on the lake. So they wanted to go to Northerly Island. Of course, Miggs Field, you know, you bulldoze it. Now kids go and see concerts there. But that's where the faculty wanted to go. Uh, Mayor Daly definitely wanted to shore up the loop. And this is kind of, you know, he always was about protecting the tax base and the loop. And so he wanted to go with the railroad terminals. If you know where the, uh, the jewel is, used to be the Dominic's over at uh, Canal and Roosevelt. Now railroad lands federally controlled. And if you look at the projections, which we're about to, you just didn't have time to jack around because, you know, with the federal red tape and et cetera. Now there was one other possibility and that was Garfield Park. So it's interesting if we had ended up in Garfield Park, really might have radically changed the, uh, the look of the, you know, Chicago's west side. But we end up at Harrison and Halstead. The reason for that is the work done out of uh, Hull House. So Jane Adams, an Iowan, graduates from Rockford College and goes to Chicago and says, point me to the direction of the poorest neighborhood in the city. And they send her to Harrison and Halstead. At the time, it had the, uh, was second in the number of uh, people per square mile, only uh, second in Mumbai, India. So massive population. She founds Hull House. It's a settlement house. It's not the only uh, settlement house in the area, but by far it's the most prominent. And so this area, you know, the near west side, it's the Ellis Island of the Midwest. Uh, it was, um, on the, you know, you had heavily Italian immigrants, but uh, also, you know, you had African Americans, you had Mexican, Puerto Rican, 
Greek, there was some spillage. Of course, now it's kind of, you know, block, we think of the, you know, kind of blocked off by the Eisenhower, but definitely some Greeks in the area. And uh, so at Hull House, it's, it's, it's mostly men and, and or, I'm sorry, it's mostly women and children. The men don't hang out so much. But uh, you've got cooking and sewing classes, language courses. Benny Goodman, the big band, uh, big band leader, learned to play the clarinet at Hull House. Uh, but another thing that comes out of Hull House, um, well, one thing is the first juvenile court system, which if you're familiar with the parking lot at Polk and uh, right across from Hull House, that's the first juvenile courts in the nation. Uh, similarly, though, uh, another first is you have community planning from the community. So they, they uh, stand up what's known as the Near West Side Planning Board at Hull House. They hire their own architect and they begin to develop plans to get rid of all the factories, do away with most of the commercial and uh, end up uh, going with uh, you know, almost a suburban enclave. And they're so, you know, I, I guess accomplished that they get, the, they get the place cited for federal renewal, uh, slum removal money. Is Daly's looking, so he's so dedicated to having a, a downtown loop location for the, the students of Chicago to attend this university that, you know, he's willing to match a dollar for dollar difference from where the trustees wanted to put it, you know, out in Maywood, uh, Riverside. So with the money attached, now almost immediately the neighborhood rises up in protest and it's pretty much led by the women, uh, in particular Florence Scala, the neighborhood matriarch. Now the reason for this is, the 11th, or I'm sorry, uh, the near west side, outside of Daly's 11th Ward in Bridgeport, is probably the, 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 the strongest bastion of his support. And uh, so many in, this, in many cases, the guys were, you know, working city jobs. So there was no way they could protest, uh, one, because they're at work and you're not going to protest your boss. So it's left up to the neighborhood um, women. And they, uh, you know, for a bunch of amateurs, not too bad. They, uh, they had, goes all the way to the Supreme Court, uh, is turned down. But uh, of course, by that time, They've already begun to remove the neighborhood. So now this is not Hiroshima or Nagasaki. This is actually the near west side. This is the UIC neighborhood. The only thing remaining, don't be fooled by what the university has been able to preserve, you know, Hull House. Uh, that's just one segment. What you have there, um, you know, in the foreground, that's the Hull House. Uh, think of it as the compound. Series of buildings connected pretty much went as far west into campus as the quad, you know, starting, you know, so think of Halstead, you know, pretty much to halfway through the campus uh, before you hit the library. And then as far south is, uh, is Taylor. Now, the reason why Daly was so, and, law, and policymakers were just so concerned is if you do the numbers, right, you come back from military service, 1944, 45, 46, you know, do the math 18 to 22 years later, you've got married having kids. So here you have the bipartisan uh, support for this bond issue in 1960, don't cheat our kids out of college. So you can see those enrollment projections, 1960 to 1969. And this is a boom time for campus construction. So places like the State University of New York and uh, University of California system are putting up multiple campuses, but they're all looking at, uh, at University, well, at UIC, or at the time University of Illinois Chicago Circle, is kind of the, the forerunner of the model. Uh, it's uh, the, the gig goes in large part to Walter Netsch, um, who gets it because of his work at the Air Force Academy. If you can see, um, you see the slide there of Air Force, their classroom buildings look a lot like ours. So if you think of before they get reconfigured, uh, you know, with the geothermal, but if you think of like Taft, Adams Hall, yeah, it's pretty much because it's a Netsch design. And then you hear the, uh, what is more famous buildings in the background, the chapel. But so Netsch uh, Nitch gets the job and it's almost instant Breaking is October of 63, the campus opens 22 February of 65. Um, so now we were known as UIC when we were at Navy Pier, University of Illinois at Chicago, essentially, or Chicago undergraduate division, but we all knew it was UIC. When we come to campus, the new campus, we're saddled with the name University of Illinois Congress Circle and then later Chicago Circle. So we're named after a traffic pattern. Uh, didn't go over too well with the faculty and staff, but they were told not to and I'm, I'm serious about this, don't fret and lament, other fine institutions have been named for traffic patterns. And they go on to cite places like Oxford and Cambridge, but kind of slap in the face, but you know, nonetheless. All right, trivia question. 
So behavioral sciences building, which as you can see in the picture, is laid out as such uh, because why? If we can get that slide up. There's no explanation, it just is what it is. Secluded classrooms, field theory, or a rat maze, because you know, it is the behavioral sciences. And trust me, people that have worked there, I think of Dick Simpson, who's a long time prominent you know, political science professor. Dick's told me some days he even gets lost. Uh, the signage is much better, but um, nonetheless. All right, so the winner, yes, field theory. So apparently we have some people here who know their campus. What that is, is Netch is sort of going beyond the boredom of the box. He's playing with um, the rotated, basically the rotated square. You just keep rotating it on top of each other. Um, it's interesting. So if you haven't been to our campus, I would enc encourage you to do that, but uh, more than likely all of you have at some point been in BSB. Uh, a couple other field theory buildings are architecture as well as science and engineering uh, south. The campus, uh, one of its signatures in its original configuration was just a, a whole lot of cement. So here you had spiraling uh, walkways outside of University Hall. Here you have an overview. Now, the original mandate was to build a campus for 32,000 students projected in, in 105 acres. So that's a lot of students in very confines, uh, you know, small confines. So you could get off the blue line, you know, at UIC Halstead and walk basically across campus on this second level of walkways, pretty much all the way to uh, the Phys Ed building across Roosevelt Road. The, the design, uh, the campus is designed as a stone dropped in a pond of water. And what that would be, with, uh, if you think of the old uh, circle forum, you know, it's the Greek amphitheater, that would be the point of impact, right? You drop the stone in, and then you have these concentric circles. So the first set would be the lecture centers, and you have classroom buildings, uh, the library and uh, student union, and then finally, uh, like SEL, University Hall, et cetera, kind of the furthest out. So it's unique that it's not designed by discipline. So, I mean, it's not like, you know, the humanities building, right? It's, it's by function. So that kind of sets the campus apart. It's winning. Uh, I was really shocked when I first came aboard in June of 98. Um, you know, I was one of the first things I was doing was researching the architecture. And I was shocked it's winning all these awards within the profession. Uh, you know, it's not so warm and friendly, but very functional and just uh, really was seen as the future. So here we have an example of those second level walkways. Uh, what ends up happening is uh, the walkways. Uh, the, the, the Minnesota granite, which were the walkways, they were going nowhere, indestructible. But the cement staircases to get there begin to fall apart. We'll talk about that a little bit later on, but here's some images of those. Uh, and all the buildings of the original design were designed to be entered primarily through the second floor. So, you know, if you think about your experience in those buildings, it may explain a bit. So take a look at University Hall there because we have another trivia question. University Hall is built slender on the bottom and wider on the top. For what purpose? You can go ahead and vote. Riot proof. Is it designed to be riot proof? Is it structural integrity? City of broad shoulders or just to make it unique? Give you a couple more seconds. Oh, we have a winner, City of Broad Shoulders. All right, folks that know their campus history. Left well, as an orientation leader, I, uh, I spun the myth as many of us had, you know, it just makes sense, right? Riot proof, the whole idea, you know, that you couldn't scale it or whatever. Uh, yeah, not, not really, because the, uh, the plans actually predated the Berkeley free speech movement. So it sounded nice, but you know, now it's my job in life to redo everything I did summer of 95 and 96. So deprogramming, so thanks for letting me help deprogram you. Another interesting feature is, uh, or one of the questions I often get about University Hall is, for those of you familiar, the Chancellor and Provost's office are up on 20, or on 28, it's a 28 story building. And it's kind of fun because, you know, it's set apart from all the skyscrapers, you know, in the loop. So it's definitely kind of a point to navigate if you're out in, you know, in West Loop. So it definitely, you can see it across campus and, you know, throughout the city. But uh, so the Chancellor and Provost are up on 28. And so the thought was the elevator goes from one to 27, and then you have to take a smaller elevator to get to 28. 
people always thought that, you know, it was there to protect the chancellor from, you know, student protests. But again, it's all predates Berkeley, you know, campus, uh, campus uprisings and et cetera. But what that is, is in order to maintain the symmetry on the top of the roof, uh, you, you know, you have it go to 27 and then the, you know, the mechanical space for that is on 27. And then you need much smaller, you know, just to go 27 to 28. So that way you keep the flat roof and, you know, so that was Netch's idea. But I have to tell you, I am sure every provost and chancellor is thank the good Lord that they had that sort of <laughs> safety net. And when all, when, when all else fails, take the stairs, right? So let's see, moving along. So the pros and cons, I guess, to the, uh, the Netch, you know, Netch design. Now, top side, you know, on top of those lecture centers, you had these exedras. And so on a nice day, you know, they had these little, like you could sit, um, you know, sort of stairs where a professor, you know, could give a lecture to a class, you know, go outside, whatever. This was known as the chick watching exedra as you could, you know, check out the ladies. Okay, great, top side, fine. Down below is where it kind of began to fall apart. Known as the tombs, if you're walking down below here, and this is kind of my experience, I'd come visit, uh, my dad was an alum, so, you know, this is my first experience and in my freshman year. Uh, pretty dank, uh, you know, dreary, you know, you just get wet down there, just not real pleasant. So as I said, the campus opens up uh, 22 February, 1965, almost Insta campus. Uh, you had the original, uh, what is now the quad, if we have any um, you know, more younger alums watching or, or current students, what you would know as the quad was this Greek amphitheater in between the student union and, uh, and the library. And so taking advantage of its unique location, you had Antigone in the original Greek. When they ran out of Greek speakers, uh, you just recruited a wait staff out of Greek town. University has always been a big part of the UIC experience here. We have homecoming queens 67 and 68. Now, certainly at Navy Pier, you think diversity probably more, uh, well, one, higher education for the masses was, was pretty unique. Uh, but probably uh, diversity satisfied more Eastern European. Uh, but certainly we had um, Native American, Latinos, African Americans at Navy Pier, Asian Americans. Uh, one of our more prominent football players and the last uh, head coach of, of circle football, UIC football, was a Japanese American named Hal Nomoto. We did have a football team for two extra dollars in uh, 1951. The students voted to have a, a football program stood up, two extra dollars in their student fees. It's interesting because according to correspondence I've read out of the Urbana Athletic Department, once we get a football team at Navy Pier, they look at it as fait accompli. One day we will have our, our own team. Now at Navy Pier, we were known as the uh, Chicago Illini because there was still that connection where you, know, you, you were a branch of Urbana. And then we moved to uh, the near west side, Chicago Circle, and we're known as the Chicas. But trek with me for a moment. Say that you're Grand Valley State, one of our uh, competitors, one of our rivals at the time, on a Friday, talking about the big game tomorrow against the Circle Chicas, and you understand a little Spanish. I don't know, might not strike a lot of fear into your heart knowing you're playing a bunch of girls in the morning. But actually, Chicas, as you can see the spelling, it's actually uh, based on a, a, highly, a highly advanced Native American tribe there. They're, they had their own written language. So at that time, sort of keeping in line with the Illini, another Native American tribe, uh, we actually had our own chief, as you can see, 1965. We shelved the chief as well as uh, we, dropped, uh, we dropped the Chicas about 1977. And so for like three years, we're just simply known as Circle. Circle what? I don't know. Just, it's just Circle. So. The uh, of uh, President David Henry with board uh, members of the Board of Trustees. Henry was very reluctant, to, one of those people very reluctant to see a uh, Chicago campus grow. He thought Navy Pier was fine, kind of a major beachhead in Chicago, but more for like trade, trade kind of programs, not, not real into, certainly fine, you can have undergraduate programming eventually, but, but you're not going to get into graduate program. We'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, but really, uh, Circle Campus, the fastest growing campus in the nation for a period of about three years. Typical, uh, you know, history department, English department hiring, you know, a couple of profs a year. You know, they're hiring upwards of 10 to 15, 20. English hired so many that uh, when, when the economy goes south and the uh, community colleges start getting built in the early 70s, they have to lay off a ton of professors. Now, it's not like Chicago lacks for higher education options, right? We've talked about that, right? I mean, there's, as far as four-year institutions, you get, you know, Loyola, DePaul, IIT, Northwestern, University of Chicago. They exist, um, North Park, et cetera. 
So in order to move in, right, because I mean, all these lawmakers, they have law degrees, oftentimes from law schools, places like DePaul, Loyola. So as the university wants to move in, you have to cut these gentlemen's agreements. And so this leads to a real limit. So for instance, no residence halls, you know, until, well, 1988. Uh, you don't, we don't have an MBA program called an MBA program until after consolidation, which is 82. I think that actually becomes an MBA program about 85. So a uh, limit on night courses, just all these kind of limits. So there's external factors, but then we also kind of shoot ourselves in the foot too. So uh, we have a eight foot wall that surrounds the campus um, and it uh, quickly is dubbed Fortress Illini. So the thought is we're in the city, but not really of the city. And uh, another thing that, that uh, saddles the campus is this thing called urban mission which is often used to limit the campus by various, uh, various folks, uh, including even a, at one point an attempt to lop off the campus, you know, sort of losing it from this urban mission uh, by this guy, James Holderman, who was basically the de facto uh, vice chancellor of administration. But they do a lot of community outreach. Uh, one of the reasons, uh, Holderman's kind of brilliant in some ways. Uh, while the west side of Chicago is burning, you know, 67, 68, riots and et cetera, um, the campus stays solvent. Part of that is because you have all these building service worker positions opening these jobs up to you know the neighborhood as well as opening up the phys ed building and then the lecture centers for things like gospel sings and summer youth programs uh, really you know kind of goes against uh, you know Fortress Illini and really you know sort of ingratiating yourself you know you know partnering with the neighborhood uh, but as I said urban mission the thought is because you uh, because you did, you know, be, because you um, displaced X amount of residents on the Chicago's near west side, what is your obligation to said population or to the city of Chicago? Should UIC or Circle Campus be responsible for remedial work, you know, that CPS, you know, wasn't able to, to accomplish? Or is that the job of the city college? And so during this time, you also have, uh, I find this a, would have been a fascinating class. I, I love politics, Chicago politics. So this would have been fun. But so here you have a team talk course. And this course went on even up till today. It's called the future of Chicago. And so it was team taught by Dick Simpson, who was a reform alderman. And here you have him being seated on orders of uh, his honor, Mayor Daly in the city council chambers. But so definitely um, anti Daly. But then team taught by Milt Rakoff, one of his colleagues in poli sci, who was a uh, Democrat committeeman wrote an insider's inside account of uh, you know Democrat machine, uh, but it just would have been fascinating, I think, to just sit and you know just watch them. And then all the speakers they come in, even annually, just um, even if you're not taking the course, oftentimes uh, you know it's it's uh, the the speakers speak at either uh, uh, Hillel or at uh, Newman Center, and uh, it's just really interesting, uh, kind of a who's who of Illinois and Chicago politics. Now, as you can see. Uh, Circle in the 70s, Circle University in name only, kind of a 10 year identity crisis. It's kind of like, what are we gonna be? You know, are we, you know, what is our, you know, the urban mission, we're, we're, we're kind of dealing with that. Uh, there was really this, fee, you know, the, the, the peer, for the students that went to Navy Peer and then transferred to Urbana, they had stronger outcomes than the students that did all, did all four years at, at Urbana. So um, the people at the, at the peer were definitely, those professors were very strong teachers. But then the folks that were recruited you know, to man Circle Campus very much were sold on a dream of making the place UCLA of the Midwest, you know, in the next 10 years. And so kind of this push-pull. And so, as you can see, the indictment in the, the Sun-Times, um, eventually, and Mayor Richard J. Daley, for all his different um, uh, accomplishments, really considers his, his founding of the university, or, you know, his, 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 you know, helping establish the campus his greatest contribution to the life of the city. And, you know, getting back to, you know, he was so adamant about having the bond issue passed and, you know, really putting his political uh, capital where his mouth was with, with, you know, being determined to have it accessible to CTA and, and, and uh, commuter train lines in the, center, in the center city. It took him 10 years to go, you know, to undergrad while he's working during the day, going to night school at the Paul and then going to law school at the Paul. So it's expensive and it's just not very, you know, doable in many cases. So, uh, you know, despite where we were in the mid seventies at the 10 year anniversary, he considered it his greatest contribution to the life of the city. Of course he passes in 76. Um, but moving out of 
you know, 75, 76, later half of the 70s, really the, the decision is uh, made to become the best public urban research university we can be. And so, you know, part of that maturation was the, the, uh, the consolidation, which had begun under President uh, uh, Eichen or Corbally in 1979, you know, he had floated the idea. Eikenberry, the new incoming president, comes in and makes that, you know, decides that's going to be his, his um, you know, big, bold move. And so on 1 September 1982, you, you, um, you have that there. You have Jim Thompson. Um, he got his start in politics at Navy Pier, actually, in student government, but uh, he was the first commencement speaker. Now, the election of uh, uh, Mayor Harold Washington, Chicago's first African-American mayor in 1983, is watershed for the campus because you have for the first time UIC professors and administrators, um, and I'm going to be hurrying up because I see we're almost out of time, sorry about that, uh, but what you have is UIC professors on its transition team, and so no longer just in the city, but of the city, and so you have the table being set for things like the Great Cities Commitment, quickly run through some things that have changed the, the course of the campus uh, since 82. So within five years, you reach uh, Research One status, but the time was the top uh, 100 universities as far as federal research dollars go. Um, residence halls, the joke at Circle Campus was the professors used to race the students to the buses and trains by uh, 3 p.m. Good luck having any programming in the afternoon. Uh, it was a ghost town. But with the, uh, the addition of uh, first Eastside residence halls, Commons North South, Courtyard, and then eventually uh, in 93 with Commons West, you have more of an 18 hour feel and then eventually we'll move into with South Campus. We'll talk about that in a moment, but more of a 24 hour. We, you know, we live in a global economy. So, you know, we definitely, you know, we accentuate this. If you're gonna live in a global economy, you, you know, live in a diverse city, we hype this. Why not, you know, why, why go, why go to campus, um, you know, in some place that doesn't reflect the world uh, nearly as well as it could. And so, as you can see, even our majority at UIC is less than 50%. And um, it just makes for, you know, fascinating campus experience. Campus core revitalization, renovation. Uh, so basically it's, it's deconstructing the original Netch design, all that uh, cement, and pretty much going green. So I have to admit, I used to miss it, eating Carms and Mario's Italian ice with my dad uh, in the forum, walking the upper level, but um, the campus, we, we, uh, we bequeath uh, my daughter and uh, all the current students, uh, definitely more green, more palatable. Great Cities commitment, what started under Washington, you know, is. Uh, solidified under the chancellorship of James J. Stuckel. So you have UIC not just partnering with the city of Chicago, uh, which, you know, the really originally the daily idea was to be a pipeline from the campus into city departments, you know, education, economics, et cetera. But because of various things regarding daily, the 60th convention, et cetera, uh, it distanced itself from that. And so with Washington, as you get this great city's commitment you have these partnerships, for instance, large sections of Chicago School Reform Act, you know, drawn up in our College of Education, but, um, you know, everything from public health, economics, transportation, not just helping, uh, you know, solve Chicago problems, but really uh, urban issues globally. Academic renewal. We, uh, we had an honors college and it was done away. That comes back. Uh, guaranteed professional program admission, 1996, students that might not uh, necessarily look at UIC all of a sudden very much looking at UIC as it guaranteed them a spot uh, in a professional program by committing his undergrads. Stanley Fish, very polarizing figure. Some thought him, you know, sort of academic god. Others, the great Satan. But uh, definitely um, raised the level of awareness of the campus within uh, academia and, and, and within the, the nation. Uh, the late 70s and the early 80s, you have the move to Division I. We'd won back-to-back -back, uh, Division II uh, gymnastics titles in 78-79. So we go Division One, and then we build the, uh, the UIC Pavilion, now known as the Credit Union One Arena. That stood up in 1982. So these things kind of come together. You know, the whole idea is if you're going to be, as we push to be the premier urban, uh, premier urban uh, research university, these are the kind of things you need to do, whether it's athletics kind of hitting on all fronts, academics. So when we consolidate in 82, what were possible names for UIC athletics proposed? If we get that done. The last of our, is it the clout? Chicago is very political. Skyscrapers, well, you've seen the skyline. Gangsters, you know our history. Or the flames. Give you a few moments. 
and I'm happy to stay on for questions. Sorry, I am trying to run through this. Okay, well, what's well, yes, so obviously flames was proposed and flames was your winner. Cloud was amazingly, yes, clout was uh, an option and skyscrapers. The only one that wasn't was gangsters. If you ever get a chance, it's a chance to plug University Archives. If you get around campus, go up the third floor of University Archives, and there's actually a history exhibit, a public history exhibit that kind of goes over the history of Sparky actually used to look like a tomato. He was known as Tommy the Tomato Head, but nonetheless. And so um, along with this, we shelve our, we had a hockey program. We shelved that in 1996 and kind of put all our resources into men's and women's basketball. We hire a former Urbana um, assistant, Jimmy Collins. And so we, uh, you know, kind of riding the wave of uh, raising the level of awareness uh, through athletics with tournament bids, 1998, 2002, and 2004, and an NIT bid in 03. As a young institution, we we're able to stand up our first uh, privately funded uh, through alum uh, building, the old uh, practice hockey rink we turned into the Flames Athletic Center. It helps UIC and the pros, as well as those that don't go pro, but, you know, we do have UIC pro athletes. Uh, Jay Demerit every year when, uh, or every couple of years when uh, World Cup comes up, you can see a very prominent soccer player. Uh, UIC gained some publicity from that. And then Curtis Granderson, the uh, first UIC Flames athlete to play in a major professional sports championship as a Detroit Tiger in 2006. And uh, just a class act to help represent your university. Now we'll move um, back to this map and finish up South Campus as we wrap up the presentation. So the original boundary of the university was uh, just south of Roosevelt Road, um, the phys ed building. For those of you that are uh, familiar with the Blues Brothers, think Aretha, uh, Aretha Franklin uh, singing, You Better Think. Seal Maxwell Street Market, very vibrant, uh, hotbed of blues music. It's the birthplace of the infomercial. Uh, as you can see through those slides, was very vibrant at one point, the place you could buy back your hub cap, hubcaps on Sunday that were stolen on Tuesday. Uh, however, by the uh, by the 80s, uh, well, the university is buying up parcels of space throughout the 70s, 80s, and into the 90s. And with the rising land values, the city is more than happy to have the university play, um, you know, developer. And so here you have artist rendering and final product of uh, UIC South Campus University Village, where you have first floor retail, second, third, and fourth floor uh, uh, res uh, residence halls with uh, Robinson and Beckham Hall. And then finally, uh, James J. Stuckel Towers, uh, goes up in, I believe it's 2007, there you have the view from uh, the Dan Ryan. I joke, uh, perhaps the you know most expensive piece of real estate our students will ever enjoy is their college res hall, but you know, you never know, aim higher, right? Here's a, like this image kind of juxtaposes the campus, uh, you know, uh, you know west, west Loop, south, Southwest Loop, um, you know, with, uh, with downtown. You know, as UIC uh, strives to be the premier public urban research university. In 2012, at our 30th anniversary, we actually were found to be uh, voted number 11 in top, top, university, uh, top 100 universities uh, under age 50. So not bad for a 30-year university at the time. And then some recent expansion. Well, back in 1971, the regional medical sites at Rockford, Peoria, and Urbana, regional nursing in the Quad Cities. And then um, you know, Rockford certainly has expanded to pharmacy as well. And then a really exciting, something, a journey that started back in 1998, just like, you know, UIC was the answer to no public, re, uh, no public university for the longest time, we had uh, began our attempts to, uh, to merge and acquire John Marshall. And so in 2019, Chicago now has its only public law school, UIC's John Marshall. And then more recently with the master plan, you, um, you have new campus buildings going up, including the academic and... Uh, residential structure at uh, Morgan and Harrison. We'll finish with uh, some prominent notable alums. Give you a moment to take a look at that. Really, it was the partnership between Jim Thompson as a Republican at the state level and Richie Daly as a you know, Chicago mayor. They really partnered to revitalize the pier and making it, uh, you know, Illinois' largest tourist attraction. So who knows, maybe some bipartisans uh, can work in the future on things. But, all right, cool. Well, thank you for your time and attention, and I will definitely stick around for questions. Uh, I think you can message those to Karen. And, thank you. Yeah, uh, certainly thank follow. You. Yep. Go ahead. No, thank you, Jason. This was so informative, and we—I have to tell you, uh, the webinars we've done. I'm loving the chat going on, just between alumni back and forth and sharing memories. You have 
uh, reignited lots of good thoughts and memories and some funny comments too. Um, we are scheduled to go to one, but just maybe a couple of quick questions. And then um, if people have to jump off from time, please feel free to email us at UIC alumni at uic.edu. Again, it's UIC alumni, all one word, at uic.edu. And we will share those questions with Jason and, and get back to you. Uh, but Jason, uh, first question. Um, somebody said, do I misremember that the administration was pushing skyscrapers, but the students wouldn't have it? At the time for the that, athletic? That is correct, yes. And if you haven't figured out Flames, Mrs. O'Leary's Cow, the fire was to have originated kind of over where the fire museum is, over, I think it's Jefferson and Taylor. So, but yes, that is correct. Um, great. Um, do you know when UIC embraced its mission to make education accessible? Was there a turning point that you can point to? Well, I mean, really from the beginning, um, I mean, if you, I mean, just, well, I guess when I'm, I'm talking about undergraduate education, I mean, certainly with Navy Pier, uh, I mean, education for the masses, obviously it's spurred on by the GI Bill, but the fact that the campus doesn't close, you constantly had a waiting list. I mean, um, and so from 46 to 65, you know, just good luck getting, you know, getting here it was just there was never you know and at first you had world war ii and then you've got that period but then you got uh, korean war gi vets and uh yeah i mean you had veterans but i mean just regular chicago students that just wanted to stay in the city or couldn't give up their family responsibilities or their jobs uh you know uic served that served that function um in the 19 in the mid 70s there was an attempt for about a year uh which is kind of where a circle gets its um i mean it's a very serious academic reputation squared away, but it really takes a hit in the mid 70s. So Chancellor Cheston has this, um, basically they really low, lower the admissions staff. Not for everyone, it's a small group, but uh, those students end up leaving with debt and without a degree. And um, yeah, that was unfortunate. But uh, so that's why I kind of, I guess another fortunate with consolidation, um, you know, we're kind of spurred on to sort of a new day, I guess. Uh, just one question, and then I think we'll wrap up. And again, uh, this presentation will be available at the website. You can see it right there for our alumni exchange website if you want to go back because you gave so many great pieces of information. And, um, and so it will be available in about 10 days. Um, you touched on this a little bit, but the question came up about why don't we have a football team today? What was it? Oh, sure. Caused a football team to go one of my favorites. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, so we had the football team. It got shelved in 73. One of the problems was uh, David Henry, the university president, you know, he's all fine. You know, he, he kind of had a, his charge was to build a Chicago campus, but he didn't want the Chicago campus having any contact with City Hall and Mayor Daly. Daly was our obviously uh, biggest backer and a huge football fan. So it got to the point where Urbana Athletics wouldn't allow us to, our coaches, even to recruit out of pocket. We didn't have a scholarships. Um, so, I mean, it just like show up. Um, in fact, the PE program used to go to like, you know, Lane Tech, Lincoln Park, Dunbar, and just kind of, hey, if you want to play football and you're thinking about college, come to the pier or come to Circle Campus. But it got to the point where uh, Urbana Athletics wouldn't even let the, uh, the coaches recruit without even, you know, spending any money. And so where places like Grand Valley State and some of our peer institutions were building their programs, you know, we couldn't. We had a state legislator who met with one of our last coaches, and even offered to get us scholarships, plead our case in the state house. Uh, but when they went to Chancellor Norman Parker, who was a fan of football, had the team out several summers in a row for barbecues, uh, he, you know, basically the, the representative was like, get a letter from your chancellor, I'll go plead your case. And Chancellor Parker was like, can't do that. The implication was if he pushed too hard, Urbana would sack him before he was ready to retire. So when it when when they finally decided they were going to have to stand down football in 73 because and this this has been related to me by ray clay our former director of uh, campus rec and played football as well as uh, coach sternad uh, i was left to the students because the, the 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 coaches were on pe staff so once again that standing order that that the university you know chicago couldn't have contact with city hall and so it was pretty much left to the students and ironically at the 10th year anniversary when we award daily uh, an alumni award in the in the Chicago, uh, I'm sorry, the Illinois rooms, he actually references, oh, by now I thought we would have had a great team in the conference. So like he's even oblivious to the fact that two years earlier, 
we had stood it down. And uh, the fact that it's by far the, you know, next to, well, that and hockey are the two most expensive program scholarship and equipment. Um, there was a move. The Bears wanted to relocate. The, the, the state of Illinois was going to relocate a Bears stadium. This is like early 90s on what would be our South Campus. And uh, President Eikenberry nixed it and was like, nope, not going to do it. I guess the whole thought is if you have a football field on your campus, you might want to football field. So. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Yeah, I knew that Bears history, and I was going to ask about that. And you can imagine that in the um, in the chat, there's been quite a few uh, comments about the hockey team. So I'm going to leave it at that. Right. <laughs> exactly. I mean, talk about it, right? I mean, if you look, I mean, you can't tell the future, but I mean, if we had kept a hockey team, and for the record, with that hockey team, we played in basically the Big Ten slash ACC of hockey programs. You know, I mean, talking Ferris State, Michigan State, Michigan, Notre Dame. I mean, cream of the crop. So, oh well. It's a, well, again, thank, out to the puck kids. Yeah. Um, thank you, Jason, again, for all of this. It's just been absolutely wonderful. And thank you to all of you that have participated with us today. Um, again, this presentation will be available on our website. Uh, next week, please join us on Wednesday, May 6th for our next alumni exchange event. At noon, it will be featuring the uh, Dean of the College of Nursing, Terry Weaver, who will present an interactive discussion on Got Sleep? Strategies for Restful Nights and Energized Days. Uh, please feel free to check that out with us next week. and You can register online right now. Um, and of course, please be on the lookout for a survey about today's presentation. We would appreciate it. Thanks again for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you again in our next alumni exchange. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, guys. Go Flames. Go Flames, and have a great day.